OK, welcome again. Has everyone ha been able to stretch their legs and get some refreshments? Wonderful. So welcome again to the Georgia Medicaid Fair. My name is Maxine Elliott, and today we are going to talk about mental health parity. And the title of the presentation that I have for you this morning is Advancing Mental Health Parity in Georgia, a Comprehensive Approach. This isn't just about health care equality. It is about fostering a healthier, more inclusive Georgia. So I think you all have seen this and we want to drive this home because at the core of everything that we do at DCH and in the state is our purpose. We are committed to shaping the future of a healthy Georgia by improving access and ensuring quality to strengthen the communities that we serve. So before we get into the depths of the uh, presentation this morning, um, I thought it would be good just to give a little introduction as to who I am. Um, I want to again extend a heartfelt welcome to each of you for joining me here in this room today. Um, this is a pivotal session on mental health parity and your presence here speaks volumes about your commitment, your interest um, to join us in making sure that we are addressing this very cru crucial subject correctly. Again, my name is Maxine Elliott, and I'm honored to serve as the new Deputy Executive Director for the Medical Assistance Plan Division at Georgia DCH. In my role, I have the privilege of steering the course of service, delivery, and administration, ensuring that our vision of comprehensive, accessible quality healthcare is realized in every action that we take. My journey in healthcare spans over two decades marked by a deep-seated passion for behavioral health, healthcare business strategy, and quality improvement. I'm a certified public health practitioner with a rich tapestry of experiences in healthcare administration and health informatics. It spans across a few continents, actually. I've been here in North America for some time now. I've worked in this capacity in the Caribbean and Latin America, and also in the United Kingdom. And my journey has not just been about professional growth, but it's about kindling a relentless drive to bridge the gaps in healthcare access and equity. And this morning, before I proceed into the depths of mental health parity, I have a few words, I think, <laughs> from our executive leader. Um, if it's possible, just so that we can have a smooth transition, you guys, I'll just say next slide and we can just continue on. OK, so if you could move to the next slide, please. OK, so really quickly, um, our commissioner, Russell Carson, sent these words for you this morning. He said, I stand firmly committed to mental health parity across Georgia. Our pledge at DCH is to do our part to strengthen equitable access to mental health services, prioritizing mental health on par, on par with physical health is a critical step toward nurturing a healthier Georgia. And then Dr. Dean Burke, some of you saw him this morning in the opening remarks. He serves as our chief medical officer and he states our mission involves advocating for a healthcare system where mental health is given equal importance as just as important as our physical health. Mental health parity, House Bill 1013, is not just a legal mandate, it is a moral imperative. We are dedicated to fostering an inclusive healthcare environment that recognizes mental well-being in overall health. And then Stuart Portman that you just heard in the greater room, uh, our new uh, um, the executive director for the MAPS division. He's actually my boss. Um, he says, I am acutely aware of the disparities in mental health care. Our division strives every day to innovate, collaborate, and drive changes that ensure mental health services in Georgia are accessible and equitable for all of our beneficiaries. Now, there's a reason why I wanted to start this morning with these three quotes. 
many of you who are out in the community doing the hard work, serving the beneficiaries, sometimes don't have that direct link to our executive leadership. And I think the main thing from these quotes is that you take away with you today the fact that you have top-down support in serving our beneficiaries in the community. And we appreciate everything that you do. Next slide, please. So in order to set the stage, let us take a comprehensive view of the current state of mental health in the USA and also in Georgia, with a focus on children, adolescents and young adults. Nationally, a significant number of our youth are facing mental health challenges with major depressive episodes being reported in over 16% of our teenagers. Alarmingly, a large majority of these young individuals are not receiving the treatment that they need. So you can see here some of the stats. The big thing that we're really trying to fix here under mental health parity is that 58.9% of our youth that do not have access to care cannot afford to get the care that they need for their mental health issues. I think technology is not my friend this morning. Can you try to transition to the next slide, please? Okay, so in Georgia, while we have data that mirrors national trends for adults, we recognize that our children and adolescents face similar challenges as the adult population. These include issues related to depression, substance use, and general mental well-being. Access to care remains a significant barrier, not just for adults, but for our younger population too. In the state of Georgia, the prevalence of adults reporting mental health issues is 11.31%, and 3.92% having serious thoughts, serious thoughts of suicide and self-harm. Specific st statistics for the children and adolescents in Georgia are not really precise and we have to do a little bit more work and we are involved in many work groups and sessions to understand the specifics of what's going on with our children and young people. But understanding these statistics is crucial. They not only highlight the breadth of mental health challenges across all the age groups, but also underscore the urgency and necessity of our efforts in mental health care, advocacy and policy making. This data supports the importance of targeted mental health initiatives and support for these vulnerable age groups. Ah, it worked. OK, so one of my objectives for this session is that everyone leaves with a good understanding of the essence of mental health parity. At its core, mental health parity is about equality, treating mental health on the same footing as physical health in healthcare coverage. The Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act of 2008 set the stage nationally. And here in Georgia, we are committed to upholding these standards. Our approach ensures that insurance plans offer balanced benefits for mental health, substance use disorders, and physical health treatments. By continuously enhancing our reporting and compliance mechanisms, we are ensuring that all Georgians receive equitable and comprehensive health care, mental health care included. Here is an overview of the concept of mental health parity its legal background and its practical applications, and how these principles are implemented and monitored right here in the state of Georgia. And so you can see by the definition, we're really talking about equality and equity. The same way we look at physical health, finally, we're now taking the charge to look at mental health in the same level of severity and importance. And then as you go through, we have the state level, 
where we actually are implementing much of everything that the, the federal government has put in place, but then we're also putting in the state mandates to make sure the providers and all of the network of CMOs and other entities that work with us are falling into line, are compliant, and are very transparent in their processes around mental health parity. So because we're here in the state of Georgia, I wanted to take a little deep dive into HB 1013, which is the Georgia Mental Health Parity Law. This bill enacted in 20, 20, 2022 marks a new era in mental health parity in our state. It's not just about equal coverage in insurance plans, it's about real changes in the availability and the quality of mental health services. From expanding treatment access, to enhancing law enforcement training for mental health crises and establishing incentives for future mental health professions, professionals. Sorry, HB 1013 is a comprehensive approach to improve mental health care. Crucially, it includes provision for monitoring and reporting, ensuring that these changes are effective and that insurers are held accountable for parity compliance. This bill represents a significant step toward a more equitable and responsive mental health care system in Georgia. This was just a quick overview of House Bill 1013, and it highlights its objectives, the key features on this diagram here, and the expected impact on Georgia's mental health care system, making it a crucial part of the state's efforts in ensuring mental health parity. So how does that impact the providers and even our beneficiaries? So this slide here sheds some light on this direct impact of HB 1013 on both healthcare providers and patients. Let's take a look at the providers first. This law is not just a mandate, but it's a support system for the providers, offering training and resources for better mental health care delivery. It also facilitates the establishment of more mental health crisis centers, ensuring that urgent care is just a step away for those in need. For our patients or beneficiaries, this translates to more accessible and timely mental health services. Importantly, the law revolutionizes how police and our emergency responders engage with mental health crisis, fostering a care first, preventative approach and moving away from the sick care model. It is essential for health plans to not only comply with mental health parity laws, but also to transparently report their compliance, not to, just to the state, but for public access also. This process involves regular and detailed reporting, providing critical data that guides our ongoing evaluation and improvement strategies. Health plans in Georgia are required to demonstrate how they are meeting mental health parity requirements. So this means that there's regular reporting by insurers on parity compliance, ensuring ongoing oversight and transparency, and provides the state with a data-driven mechanism to assess, correct, and improve. Through this, we can ensure that mental health parity is not just a policy, but a practice, benefiting all Georgians. In order for us to start to see outcomes, we must, we absolutely must, have partnership between state entities, providers, and care management organizations. So the role of uh, the Department of Community Health is a critical leadership role in the transformative journey right here in Georgia. As the agency responsible for implementing and overseeing these laws, DCH is committed to ensuring their success. Our future initiatives aim to not only comply with these laws, but to innovate, collaborate, and expand mental health services in Georgia. This involves strategic workforce development, and a commitment to enhancing the range and quality of all the service we provide, services we provide. So one of them is the early periodic screening, diagnostic and 
Diagnostic and Treatment Program. I'm not sure if you've heard about that, EPSDT. So this program is instrumental in upholding mental health parity with a significant impact on the care of children and adolescents, including those with autism. This preventative health program ensures regular mental health screenings are a part of pediatric care, facilitating early identification of mental health concerns. For the autism population, EPSDT is particularly vital. These screenings can lead to the early detection of ASD, autism spectrum disorders, allowing for timely intervention and access to the appropriate specialized services. This early intervention is also key to enhancing outcomes and supporting the developmental needs of children with autism. By integrating these crucial mental health assessments into routine health checks, EPSDT not only embodies our dedication to mental health parity, but also significantly contributes to the early and effective support of one of the most vulnerable population, which is children with autism. It's very quiet. I hope you're absorbing all of this information well. Okay, so it's a lot of talk about policy making and what we want to do. How are we doing in Georgia? Let's take a look. What has the progress been? Our approach has been multifaceted, involving collaboration across various government agencies and CMOs. Together, we are working tirelessly to expand access to mental health services, improve care quality, and ensure policy compliance across the state. And I can personally tell you, since I've joined DCH at the beginning of the year, the level of collaboration is intense. It's really intense. And we're making a concerted effort to make sure that we're partnering with the right stakeholders, both within the state government ecosystem and outside. And um, I think it's going to really bring about some wonderful outcomes and improved um, experiences of the members and the providers. So significant steps have been taken to establish more mental health resources, including crisis centers and telehealth services. We are also focusing on the future of mental health care by investing in training and workforce development, ensuring that we have skilled professionals ready to meet our community's needs. So we've fostered, we spoke about fostering partnerships. Um, I see some of my colleagues in the back of the room here. DBHDD is a, a, a very active, strong and present partner with everything that's going on around mental health and the, the youth in our state. I personally have um, been working with them very intensely. And the Department of Human Services also and we're aiming to provide integrated and comprehensive mental health services through these collaborations. We cannot do it all on our own. And then we have collaborations with the CMOs. So one of the things that I really like about um, some of the progress that's happened in Georgia is how the HB 1013 has provided support for our younger people coming up, um, young professionals who are interested in the arena of mental health um, services, behavioural health care, psychology, all of those things, social work. Anyone who is now interested in walking into that um, career line, uh, they get help. They get help um, in, in uh, forgiveness, loan forgiveness, which I think is a really, really significant step in the right direction. So ensuring compliance with mental health parity laws, and you're going to hear me say compliance, compliance, compliance over and over again, and enhancing data-driven strategies have been also very crucial in our efforts. If we're not measuring how we're doing, we won't know. And so we're very focused on that. We're not just implementing policies, we're continuously monitoring and adapting them to ensure they effectively meet the needs of our vulnerable citizens. Now. I only had a set amount of time. This is not an exhaustive, li exhaustive list, so please, 
this is not all that has happened, but these are just some of the um, evidences, some of the things that have actually happened in Georgia as a result of its mental health parity focus. The central to all the strides we have made regarding mental health care is um, the DCH mental health parity website. So then it is an essential resource for all of us to understand and how to enforce mental health parity laws. The Georgia Department of Community Health provides comprehensive information on mental health parity through its website. This platform educates on federal and state parity laws, including HB 1013, ensuring health plans cover mental health and substance use disorders equitably. Another significant um, step that we've taken in Georgia is the mental health complaint parity, the mental health parity complaint portal, which is also on DCH's website. You can get access to it there. It's a significant milestone and it reflects our commitment to ensuring that individuals' concerns about parity in Medicaid and other plans are identified, heard and addressed. Very, very simple comprehensive public facing portal that anyone can access to submit their concerns, their questions around mental health parity. This tool also allows individuals to submit complaints regarding parity concerns in Medicaid, in peach, check, peach care for kids, um, or even the state health benefit plan, ensuring adherence to mental health parity regulations. Our collaborative work with CMOs like Amerigroup, CareSource, Peach State Health Plan has also been crucial in expanding mental health services. And in line with the Mental Health Parity and Addictions Equity Act, DCH has implemented tools for health plans to demonstrate compliance with mental health parity requirements. This includes a comprehensive standard document for annual reporting serving as a baseline. And those reports also are accessible from the public right there on the um, Mental Health Parity website. So you can actually go in there and see how everyone's doing. OK, so. Capacity building is also at the forefront of all that we do. Uh, the collaboration between DCH government agencies and CMOs, coupled with this robust reporting system compli and compliance system, has strengthened the mental health care framework in Georgia, enhancing access, equity and quality of mental health services. Another thing that I would like to bring to your attention is the impact that um, our attention to compliance with mental health parity in Georgia, how it impacted our children under the Peach Care for Kids program. Some time ago, children, the transportation needs of the PC um, for kids, it wasn't included. It wasn't a covered service. And we got together and we looked at this. And now um, we're able to say as part of our efforts and commitment to achieve in mental health parity for all Georgians, we've worked to develop policy, We've implemented the policy and we are now providing as a covered service under the CHIP program, non-emergency and ex exceptional transportation services. We recognized, we responded to the critical driver that transportation plays in ensuring timely access to care for our CHIP members. And then another spotlight that I would like to bring to your attention was on August the 18th, 2022, the CMS spotlighted the state of Georgia in their informational bulletin um, bulletin entitled Leveraging Medicaid, CHIP and other federal programs in the delivery of behavioral health services for children and youth. Now, this spotlight is not just about DCH. This is, again, evidence of the outcomes and the results of our collaborative efforts um, with DBHDD, the Department of Human Services. Um, and obviously, the, the, what we've been doing has had such significant impact. The progress is significant that CMS actually um, spotlighted Georgia. Uh, they made specific mention of the great work we are doing around early periodic screening, the EPSDT program, and also infant and early childhood mental health. These efforts are evidence of our commitment to collaboration to ensure that we achieve mental health parity right here in Georgia. 
So let's quickly take a look at the challenges. There's always challenges when there's change, right? Um, we've had some challenges and we are aware of that. Uh, we've encountered this throughout, you know, all of these great things that I've just shared with you. Um, but our commitment to overcoming them in our journey towards full mental health parity in Georgia is unwaning. Implementing parity has not been without its hurdles. Ensuring equitable coverage and access to mental health services requires constant vigilance and adaptation. So one of our, the significant challenges that uh, we, we've addressed is the placement of children with mental health needs in hotels. That was, a, that was a big challenge. We've tackled this issue head on through our partnerships and um, by increasing availability of in-state treatment options and enhancing crisis services, we've been able to bring that number right down. Furthermore, we've implemented rate increases for in-state providers, an essential move to strengthen our mental health care infrastructure and reduce reliance on out-of-state placements. There's also the QRTP bill and funding. This is another crucial piece of this puzzle, and it brings much needed funding to enhance residential treatment programs in Georgia. The QRTP bill represents a significant step forward. It provides funding to develop and enhance quality residential treatment programs, further supporting our commitment to keeping our members and our beneficiaries right here in the state. Lastly, we recognize that identifying and filling community-based gaps is pivotal. This ongoing process helps us tailor our services and resources to where they are most needed, ensuring that Georgians have access to quality mental health care where they need it. While the path towards full mental health parity is challenging, we are steadfast in our commitment to this goal. Through collaborative efforts, strategic policy implementation and continuous evaluation, we aim to create a more inclusive and effective mental health system right here in Georgia. So let's reflect on how things are from where we stand today. Let me remind you, this is just year one of year five. So I think a lot of work has gone in, not just from the state, but for everyone involved in taking care of the mental health needs of the citizens here in Georgia. The first year has been a testament to our dedication and hard work towards establishing mental health parity in Georgia. We've started strong, but this is just the beginning. The next four years of our implementation plan are crucial and there's so much more to be done. Our commitment goes beyond meeting legislative requirements. It's about genuinely enhancing the lives of those we serve. We understand that the road ahead is challenging, but it's a journey we are prepared to take, driven by our dedication to the people of Georgia. We call on each of you, our valued stakeholders, to continue this journey with us. Your insights, your expertise, your services, and partnerships are vital in shaping a future where mental health care is accessible, it's achievable, it's equitable, and it's effective for everyone. Remember, again, this is just year one of a five-year implementation plan. So looking ahead, we are inspired by the possibilities of what we can achieve together. Our vision for the future is clear, a mental health system that truly embodies parity where every Georgian, regardless of their circumstances, has access to the care they need. Together, let's continue to work tirelessly towards a healthy, more inclusive Georgia. And now it's your turn to participate. Hopefully this has hit home to many of you who have been listening. Um, you know, we've visited which is something which is really just the foundations of mental health parity. It's a very simple overview. Um, the impactful and transformative nature of HB 1013. I hope many of you have become more familiar with that. And the critical role that DCH and our other state 
agency partners play in ensuring compliance and improvement. So at this point, while I am not the, the expert, as I am still very new, um, I will open up the floor for your comments, your questions, your input, because your input, your experiences and your perspectives are invaluable in our mission to create the healthy Georgia that we all seek. Um, it's, I'm not sure if it's on the back of the cards. Okay. That is not a question that I can honestly answer, but I can tell you that it is a covered service. Okay. So anyone who is interacting with the CHIP program, mm -hmm. we have an awesome director who's, um, uh, she has a, she has maybe 30 years of information walking around with and experience, and she's very passionate about that program. Stephanie Ashlaw is her name. Um, she works in my team at DCH. And if you have any questions, you can call through and ask if you anything that you um, if, if you encounter problems, even with coverage, you know, give us a call and, and let's help you to get, you know, the claim in or the question to the right place. But just to confirm, it is a listed covered service under the CHIP program. Mm -hmm. Good morning and thank you for the information. My question, in within the five-year plan, it's great that this mental health parity has come about, and definitely we need a whole lot of work when it comes around crisis management. However, I'm interested in once you establish better network for crisis management, what happens to the continuity of care, the preventive piece that follows it? And the reason why I say that is um, last year, I had a personal intersection with how the system was lacking. I've worked in healthcare for more than 20 years. And when I had a family member to go into a crisis, um, I felt like I was lost. And through that whole five-day journey, I was looking at it from a perspective of, oh, well, if a hospitalization had occurred on the medical side, it's a clear-cut, you know, um, pathway of understanding what's the next. And I was just baffled, baffled by the facility that my loved one was in, just that that was really strange. And then even with the release, and it just made me think, if I in healthcare am having this type of experience, how do everyday people who don't have a clue of how a system ideally should work. And so I could easily see how individuals who and families that are dealing with any type of mental health, um, how we keep cycling in a broken system. So my concern is, yes, this is good and you do have to address the crises, but we also have to have some forethought about the next in helping to support the care that comes after the crises. Well, the first thing I will say is I'm very sorry for uh, the experience um, with your family member. It's never easy. I don't think there's anybody in this room that cannot say that some type of mental health situation whether it's a loved one you know hasn't impacted our lives but the level of severity now is you know not everyone has that to the point of hospitalization so there's a couple of things that come to mind um, the first thing is 
people don't get access sometimes because they don't know. All right, they're just unaware of what is available. And what I can say is that going forward, um, the efforts for myself um, as the Deputy Executive Director over Service Delivery and Administration is to be more present in the community, um, not just with me. I have a team of excellent directors who are really the experts. I am not the expert. They are the experts. And we are seeing these needs, right? So first of all, it's to make sure that the information is available for people to know. But that information doesn't fix a broken system, right? Um, from a historical context, we have to also understand the battle that not just in the public sector, but in the private sector that has been ongoing for everyone to recognize that mental health is not an infectious disease. It is a health care issue and mental health. Let's just call it behavioral health, right? It has been the stepchild for many years. In response to your question, the direction, the fact that we've got not just federal laws in place, but we've got the Georgia law in place, the, help, the 10, 1013, um, and everything that those political drivers are mandating us from the state level right down to the beneficiary to put in place and to do, means that the system hasn't been fixed yet, but it means that now we've got the center stage that we need. One of the things that um, DCH has done in response to that very real problem that you're talking about, um, we're undergoing a new procurement right now with our CMOs. And there are three pillars to that procurement. One of the pillars is behavioral health. So as we move through that, um, any available, I can't answer questions about the procurement in this, um, in this uh, setting, but any questions that you have, there, there are, if there's information available that you can access. But just to let you know that this is um, a concerted effort that whereas before we're trying to, you know, add in the community-based services to just like you say, you know, you just deal with the crisis and then bam, you're back out again. Now it's going to be a pillar within the CMO infrastructure of the state medical assistance plans, which means, right, which then means that it gives us the platform to truly look at continuum of care, to truly address well-coordinated care. We're working on, right now, we're working on a completely new, well, it's not a new, but it's an improved discharge planning procedure, which I think speaks to your experience. Um, to go into a crisis center, they deal with you, everything becomes de-escalated, they deem you stable to be discharged, but then what happens? We're looking at that, not just with our CMOs, because remember, everything that happens in the community from the state perspective is, is a, is not just, you know, within the realms of DCH. We and this is where I, I stress the collaboration, the partnerships. Um, there are different programs that we have in place in the state in collaboration with the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities. It's a match program, right? Where we're looking at those high acuity needs in the community, the real complex cases where we've tried everywhere and there's nowhere, but in that forum under that program, we're able this specialized, targeted focus with clinical expertise and every single member of the state from DJJ to DFAX to DBHDD um, to, um, you know, our, our partners in the Georgia State a Center of Excellence, where we, we, we depend on them to help us with the data collection and analysis to drive the improvements. So there are lots of different programs. But I will say this, um, earlier on this year, um, I had the pleasure of going to Baltimore to a policy lab and on behalf of the state of Georgia. And again, it was with a collaborative team of those other agencies that I mentioned earlier. And one of the things that resonated with me that I brought back home to DCH was the power of lived experience. And it's really uncanny that as you shared your question with me, it's footnoted with lived experience. I think lived experience plays a critical role in policymaking, 
in program design, in, in services, um, you know, improvements, um, all of that. Because if you're not listening to the experiences of those who actually live through the process, you know, it's one thing reading the book and having the credential or the intellect to say, well, this is what needs to happen. But we have to create more of an open forum to hear from the people who actually go through the lived experiences and let that drive or let it at least be at the table, right, to drive some of the improvements. And it resonated with me in Baltimore. And one of the things that I have got on my desk is any time I'm able to include lived experiences in everything that we do, every action we take, um, I have a commitment to do it because that's the most powerful influence in anything that we do here in the state. So hopefully I, um, I answered your question. I do believe that um, with everything that you've heard today, not just in here, but in the main um, exhibition hall, um, behavioral health, I think in Georgia, everyone's gonna see that behavioral health is it's going to come from the back. You know, when you've got those relay races and someone's lagging and they get on that home straight, we're on the home straight. I guarantee you we're on the home straight, not just as a promise, but as a mandate, as a state entity, what our responsibility is. We are required to prioritize and put a level of targeted um, innovation and improvement to how we're dealing with the behavioral health needs of, of our citizens. Hopefully that answers your question. Hi, yes, I have a question. So what plans do you have for increasing provider relations education regarding enrollment and RCM? It's very often we as a provider or an administrator, we run into the issue of not really having the support that we need to ensure quality-based care model actually turns out to be equivalent to um, in pay. So that's usually something we jump through a lot of hurdles, especially dealing with um, DCH, DBH, DD, and just in general, if you're a mental health provider specifically, you're not, you don't, qualify for certain things, let's say that your primary care would. So there's still a disconnect there in care and providers being able to afford to render that kind of care. Okay, so you, 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 that's a loaded question, right? There's a couple of things that um, stand out. The first thing you spoke about was um, the critical role that support for the providers through training, um, and uh, awareness plays and you know what I was I smiled I was looking to see who it's because I couldn't see who it was because you weren't standing but I'm glad to hear you say that because when I took um, my position at DCH at the beginning of the year working with my team of directors one of the things when we do root cause analysis on what's going on what's coming inbound to us through complaints through issues all of that stuff we are consistently seeing the root to this problem, to this complaint, is training, right? And I actually thought, I wonder if the provider community is going to think, okay, there's a new kid on the block, here comes a sergeant major. Because one of the first things I've said is we have to revamp training. We have to um, re-emphasize training because there is training there in so many different capacities across all the agencies and our external partners. But I know that many of the providers are busy doing the work and sometimes they, they're not staying up to date. Policy changes, training gets outdated or you're not aware, right? And I can tell you this, um, that one of the things that we're going to be doing is pushing back to the provider community, training opportunities, the requirement to be trained and to stay trained. Um, so hopefully that will help. Um, the financial aspect of things, um, well, let me tell you one positive thing. We've looked at how we can support the providers in state. When we get to the point that we have to be doing out of state placements, it's not, it's not a desirable thing. And I see my colleague back there, Ashley, and 
<laughs> you know, from the DBHDD crew, they're back in the room. Please talk to them um, when we when we're uh, finished here. But I'm telling you that it's not a good thing when we have to send people out of state, especially children, and separate them from family just because just because we don't have the services, the provider presence here in Georgia to provide the services. So one of the things that we have done, we've recently done um, rate increases. Um, it's not everything, but it is a step in the right direction. Um, and what that should tell you is rather than me just saying something, we understand the um, challenge, the financial challenge uh, that providers, especially in the behavioral health arena, face, and, and we're constantly looking at it. Um, so hopefully as we move forward, parity is going to require that we make it accessible. You cannot access services if you don't have providers, right? So trust me, even though we are member focused, the providers are very, very high on the list on what we can do. What can we do better um, to support the providers, to grow the provider in the community? Um, HB 1013 giving the loan forgiveness to people who want to enter into the, is, is, is a significant step as well. So I want you to know that we hear, uh, we see, we know what you do and we know the challenges you face and we are working on it with new leadership in place um, and a new breath of um, vigilance. Uh, we are really going to be driving some new changes that I hope will trickle down to your very experience as a provider. looking at time. Any more questions? I think maybe you have one, one or two. Do you have a question? And, and let me just say this in addition to what I've just said, you know, our, our entity, DCH, any other state entity, it's, it's a public service organisation, right? So you have every right to pick up the phone and call, um, send an email, um, go through our drop boxes and um, um, you know call centers that we have. We want to hear, if we don't hear, we have to listen. We're a service entity, right? So we want to hear what your experience is. Um, I know that me and my team recently, since the first part of this year, we've been working on a new layer to service delivery and administration, which is completely focused on provider experience and member experience. And that is a result of us listening to some of the complaints, the billing issues, the cycle time, all of these things that you have to contend with in, while you're giving care to these needy folks. So please reach out to us. Um, we'll always take a call. We'll always respond to an email. Um, as those issues come up going forward. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. I attended a conference earlier on in the year, the Gale Conference. Um, and it's really around, you know, it's it's the Department of Education has got the strongest presence there, but we're very committed to that and we're required to. So that is a, a, a fresh thing on, on the desk that, not fresh, it's something that has been go ongoing, but we're seeing the need to have those integrated school-based um, care programs. Um, and, and, you know, breaking down the silos, you know, everybody has a role to play, but breaking down the silos and getting everyone to talk and to work together for the good of the member is really at the forefront of everything that we're doing. But schools, school-based services is very, very high on our list and it comes up under what the mental health parity bill requires of us in the state. So I know it's, uh, you guys are so quiet, you're making me nervous, but um, hopefully this was a uh, an hour well spent of your time. I really do appreciate uh, your audience and your support. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. There's a lot more good stuff in store for you. Thank you. <laughs>